Uh, thank you so much to uh, Fan uh, for hosting, and thank you, uh, Mike, for uh, being the uh, interlocutor. Delighted, delighted to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah, me too. Uh, let's get started. So, Ian, you and I are, in addition to being colleagues, we're friends, and you and I had a conversation. I remember. I think in the Oyster Bar at Grand Central Station about this book when it was just a wee, uh, I don't even know if it was a seedling, it was a seed yeah. back then, right? And I'm very yeah. curious, and I remember you were so excited about it. This was, this was when you were, you know, you were asking those questions that every nonfiction author asks, which is, this is gonna be, what kind of book is this gonna be? How academic, how, how, you know, how much for a general audience? And it, looking at this gorgeous volume, uh, it really did, I think, strike a sweet spot, as obviously the reviews are showing, which is it's something that has 100 pages of footnotes, so there's great academic depth, but it is also, I think, speaking to a broader audience and it can educate. And I'm curious about if, if you could talk kind of from the craft perspective for a bit about just how did you go about designing, conceiving the book and how, and how do you feel about it, how it ended up? Uh, well, I feel good. I'll, I'll answer the last question first. I, I feel very, uh, very pleased with how it ended up. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, I, I see the fight for free speech, uh, my book, as a user's guide to understanding First Amendment and particularly free speech and free press issues today. Um, and the, the structure of the book that I think you and I talked about way back then was that each chapter begins with a contemporary uh, controversy and question from Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, can the NFL restrict him from doing that, to what happens to students if they walk out for National School Walkout Day and um, fight for uh, gun safety laws, um, to Nazis marching in Charlottesville, which I know we'll talk about um, today and, and what that means for hate speech. So I take these questions at the beginning, one per chapter, the beginning of each chapter, and then I talk about the key Supreme Court case that answers those questions, and in particular, the people who were involved in the fight that led up to that Supreme Court case and really try and chart their journey. So this book is, is um, I know we have some uh, law students from Loyola attending and that's awesome, but this book is really designed for people who are not lawyers. Um, you know, most of my career as a media lawyer working at ABC News and teaching uh, media law to um, communications grad students at Brooklyn College, almost all of that at this time, what I do is I'm talking to smart people who aren't lawyers and I'm trying to explain complicated and important free speech concepts to them and, and free speech law to them in a hopefully interesting um, and you know brief manner since everyone, um, particularly in the news business is quite busy. Uh, so that was um, very much the style and approach I was trying to take in writing this book in the introduction. Uh, I say that um, I reject the sort of academic model that the law is this seamless web with something Mike and I were um, taught in law school that everything you have to sort of study everything and it all connects together and you can't really begin to be a lawyer until every thread is woven together. So I say unlike that, that this book is much more like a rug from Ikea. Um, it comes much quicker and cheaper, but it covers the ground uh, just as well. So um, I think, you know, there's 100 pages of footnotes, as you say, but the book is only 200 pages. So you can, you know, read through it um, uh, in a, at a fast pace and then dig into anything else that you're particularly interested in. Well, I wanted, before we get into the, into the substantive areas, I wanted to compliment you on a really interesting just on the just as, as a book, I thought, which was the way that you dramatize the oral arguments that happen in Supreme Court chambers. And I don't know if I've ever read that before. And it's so it was a really, I thought, smart way of ushering us into the sanctum where these decisions happen and the personalities, but in a way that would that had, I thought, great depth. I mean, because when you're getting into the back and forth about how these arguments are winning or losing and how somebody's running out of time and who's hammering them or not. But it was also very interesting because you're not often plunged right into that, that very dramatic scene. I, and, and I guess, did you listen to the 
recordings or how did you go yeah. back and do this? Uh, well, thank you for that compliment. And, um, I, you know, I got a, a similar one from John Donvan, the, the um, reporter, and he had asked me, uh, one of the cases I talk about is Reverend Jeffrey Falwell versus Larry Flint, right. these two titanic um, figures uh, who couldn't be more opposite. Uh, and he nicely asked me if I was in the courtroom then, um, as <laughs> I was describing what they wore. Um, I was uh, I was in middle school, so I wasn't in the courtroom then. Um, but um, but I really spent a lot of time trying to give the flavor of not just what the arguments were, but also what it would have felt like. Um, uh, and to, as you were saying, to, to reveal some of the personalities. I find oral arguments and. You can listen to really um, almost all of the major Supreme Court oral arguments on a wonderful uh -huh. website called Oye. Um, and uh, I find that um, unbelievably exciting stuff. Um, the, the problem is that there's a lot of obstacles to accessing the exciting part um, <laughs> in textbooks. Um, you're sort of laden down with the structure of you know, studying of the law. Um, and if you just read the decisions there, it's very hard for non-lawyers um, and even many lawyers to sort of comb through um, the dialogue parts, which is the fun part, rather than the case citations and the procedures. So what I was trying to do was snip out all the boring parts um, and really just cut to the arguments. Um, and, and the, you know, the, it's really is, I use the term the fight for free speech because these really are fights, um, both intellectual, academic, and, um, and sometimes um, physical. Um, and so I was trying to convey that excitement of the, the Supreme Court um, oral arguments and I'm, I'm glad some of that uh, came across. Okay, well, let's get, so uh, I have a plan here of about four different areas I'd like to cover. And I, we don't have that much, we have, I mean, we have a, an hour and we'd like to accommodate some Q&A at the end that Lonnie is gonna handle. So I'm gonna try uh, to, if we, uh, I'm gonna try to benchmark at the beginning. So I'd like to spend about five minutes. There's one, we'll do 10 minutes, five minutes, five minutes. And I'll try and move us along if, if, I, if I'm getting long-winded or if, or if um, we want to get to the next topic. So let's start with schools and students. Yeah. I know we got a lot of organizations. FAN is, is heavily supported by educational institutions. We got um, students and teachers watching. Chapter four of the book is really interesting because it dives deep into the both the older and the newer case law that is shaping the rights that students have, which when it comes to free speech about political and social um, issues inside public schools, which is surprising for many reasons. They are minors. These are institutions. They're set up with taxpayer dollars to for the primary purpose of education. There's issues about discipline. There's lots of functions that schools, and, and you get into all those um, issues and tensions. I, I want it, one of the fascinating things, so if you nerd out as a lawyer, was you catch Hugo Black, who is the great free speech absolutist yeah. who then came up with free speech absolutism in this contradiction where he's saying, we ought to be able to prohibit um, kids from wearing Vietnam uh, black armbands to protest the Vietnam War. Yeah. And he's siding with the disciplinarian authoritarian function of, of schools when it comes to minor children in schools is fascinating. So I'm curious about, and then this gets into all kinds of stuff today about whether kids can strike on Fridays from school? What, what's the parameters of how we allow them to, um, to, to visually or performatively enact protests in a school setting? And I guess I just want you to talk a little bit about where we are. I imagine things maybe have changed since, you, since the book came out or since you uh, wrote the book. Yeah, well, there's one new exciting um, uh, development in this area, and, and let me uh, I'll loop back to that at the end. But um, I, you know, I um, I also talk about in, in the introduction how one of the other um, you know um, origin stories for me for writing this book was talking about um, speech issues with my kids who um, at the time were. Um, uh, 12 and, and 10, and they were very interested in participating in the um, National School Walkout, um, and they were in middle school at the time, and they 
you know, wanted to know what their rights were. And I realized in explaining to them what the law was um, and, and the, the key case, um, Tinker, um, that involved a young woman who was essentially the same age as my, my daughter at the time, um, that you can explain uh, the law and that wisdom can be condensed without dumbing it down. So that's always the goal of this book, talking about style before. And so I begin with, you know, so what happens if students want to leave um, the classroom, either for, as you mentioned, uh, Climate Strike Fridays, uh, Greta Thunberg's or, um, campaign, or for gun safety, or for any purposes. Um, and the answer to that goes back to the fascinating case of Mary Beth Tinker, um, who was a middle school student during the Vietnam War um, in Iowa, um, another um, Midwest uh, champion of free speech. And um, she wore this black armband uh, to protest the war and to honor the dead on both sides. This is, uh, was a very radical notion to being honored, uh, also honoring um, Vietnamese deaths. Um, at the time, um, she came from a religious and, um, and sort of pacifist background. Um, and she wore the armband to school um, you know, through the day until Mr. Moberly, her favorite math teacher, gives her a pink slip to go to the principal's office. Uh, and he, they, the principal tells her to take it off. And, you know, one of the things I love about her story is she says in a burst of courage, she decided to take that armband off right away. And she later says, you don't need to have a lot of courage. You just need to have a little courage. So even though she, she sort of capitulated, um, she was still suspended. Her brother and a friend were also wore armbands. Um, and they're suspended. Um, and this is at the beginning of the war when the war, um, beginning of America's greater involvement in the war, uh, when it was still uh, popular among a majority of Americans. A and the case goes up to the Supreme Court, um, championed by um, a very young lawyer from the Iowa Civil Liberties Union. And, uh, and for the first time in a really beautiful decision, Justice Fortas says that students don't give up their rights to free speech as they pass through the schoolhouse gates. Uh, I'm paraphrasing there, but the, the notion of passing through the schoolhouse gates um, it is central um, to this idea that, yes, students um, are basically citizens, uh, constitutional citizens, who have the right to protest. And the test that comes out of that, um, basically, is that uh, administrators can't just have some kind of un unfactually based fear um, that it might cause some type of disruption. They need to have a, a reasonable expectation, which means based on facts, and I I go, as you were saying, into the, the oral argument where Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall was really grilling the lawyers for the school district that they had no reason to believe there would be any disruption in Mary Beth's school. Um, there needs to be a basis that there would be a significant disruption. Um, so it's sort of the reasonable disruption test. And, um, and that is still essentially um, our, our test today. So what does that, in, in every chapter, I then sort of go back to the original question. Well, what does that mean for students today? Uh, it means that yes, leaving school would be disruptive um, for climate strikes or, or any other purpose, um, but school districts can't um, penalize students more for leaving class to engage in a protest than they could if you're leaving class to skip school and go to the mall. Um, so viewpoint discrimination is prohibited by the court. Um, and that is important, uh, particularly when school uh, students are protesting um, for something that is unpopular among the administration. Um, so then, so that, so that's still, Tinker is still the case you need to know about if you're, um, uh, have any questions today about student speech and you know the reasons things may change in student speech today is the court has decided this term uh, to hear a case called Mahonoy, uh, I always pronounce, always pronounce the school district wrong, but it's something like Mahonoy um, school district versus a young um, high school student who on Snapchat um, after she didn't make the cheerleading team um, uh, tweeted out uh, or uh, Snapchatted out uh, on an image um, I won't curse, even though I talk about the right to curse in my book. Um, she says, uh, F the team, F the cheerleading squad, F the school, um, spelling out that whole word. Um, 
And uh, she was penalized, she was cut from the team, um, she was threatened with suspension, um, and she won at the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals level, um, which, and based on Tinker, um, this was not only not a reasonable disruption in the, um, while you're passing through the schoolhouse gates, this was on a weekend, um, outside of the school, non-violent, non-disruptive um, speech. Um, but now the Supreme Court has agreed to take that case, even though the, the uh, Circuit Court um, basically affirmed her right um, under Tinker. So that seems so, to indicate that there's, there might be a major change afoot um, in I, students' speech rights. I had a, I had a very specific um, example I wanted to ask you about um, in light of what I read in your book. Yeah. So in Charlottesville, the school board voted under pressure from activists to ban, to, pro, to prohibit students from wearing Confederate imagery in school. Mm -hmm. And there had been another court case in the, in the county that surrounds us, I believe. And I think they had lost that court case. Um, and and I, I, I didn't do my research into this as carefully as I probably should have, because I wanted to ask you, the expert, about how you would analyze this. But it was allowed. It is standing still. And my assumption reading it is that this would be, um, knowing the general parameters, is that it would be because it would be dis it could be construed to be disruptive having imagery because it would be so harmful as a kind of in, in a closed setting to kids and that's why a court would uphold it but i was curious how you would because there was a whole free speech argument that people right. were making and it was quite controversial for some time right well so one of the reasons why i, I do supreme court cases is because it makes it so much clearer um, you have one fight that goes all the way up to the supreme court and the supreme court you know um is not um is not uh, final uh, because they're right, they're right because they're final. Um, so they get the last word. But what that means, though, um, is that, um, you know, very few cases get that type of clarity. So um, uh, we have lots of cases all the time that might not fit into what I believe or what other court watchers um, and experts believe um, are the, the actual um, decisions of the Supreme Court or, the, or, or, or jive with the precedents. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book too, is that I want people to know that free speech and advocating for free speech is really a grassroots activity. It happens in local communities and on local school boards um, and in local cases all the time. And if we don't know what our rights are um, at the sort of highest level, um, we may have them infringed upon us. So to answer your question, I would say that it is very unlikely that um, just wearing a T-shirt um, could be that had a correct, uh, Confederate flag on it would be enough um, in and of itself to justify that being restricted based on tinker. Um, we, you know, we, we really need to have some specific facts about a particular concern um, that would be, you know, very factually based about what was going on in that community and whether there was any um, reason in, to believe that there would be significant physical disruption. Again, the court talks about how in Tinker, it's not enough to just say that some student might look at the armband and think about that issue rather than- Right, right. Time. So um, in general, I would say Tinker, you know, protects not only armbands, but t-shirts of all kinds, pro-gun t-shirts, anti-gun t-shirts, um, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter t-shirts and Confederate flag t-shirts alike. Um, and that it would be, school districts would be very hard pressed to have enough of a factual basis to restrict that speech. Well, let's get, uh, and I, I would, inc I mean, everybody should read this book for so many reasons, but in part because it puts so much flesh on the bones of these ideas, because what's happening in the, in the argument when they're, when they're working this over at the court is they're thrashing out exactly what you just said, which is you, you kind of talk about the, the lead attorney for the, um, for the school getting called out because he's saying it's going to be disruptive or somehow that they're wearing these armbands and they're I think it's Thurgood Marshall is like how what in what in what specific way will it be disruptive not it could be disruptive because some there's people in the community who have been you know had people who die in Vietnam and it was really you you, you realize how much the these rules need to be tailored to deal with real experience and that they really are trying to keep government on a short leash. Okay, so with that, let's get to Charlottesville because this is, 
um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of experience that I have with these abstract Supreme Court given laws coming down to the level of a local community. Uh, so I was, you know, as, as folks, as, as um, Lonnie said in the introduction, I served as the mayor of Charlottesville during the Unite the Right rally, which you talk about. And it was so great that you talk about the events in Charlottesville in light of the Westboro Baptist Church case, because I had to talk about that a lot. When I was sitting up there on the dais trying to explain the law, and it's really kind of a miserable set of mandates that the Supreme Court has handed down for local officials to have to use. And I write about I write about this in my book, Cry Havoc, is there was this one, you know, there was a fork in the in the road. Oh, there. <laughs> thank you. I advanced um, reader copy. It's got a better <laughs> cover. So there, you know, there have been some key turning points in Supreme Court case cases where they have said, we are not going to give the benefit of the doubt to local governments. We're going to hand down bright line rules and we're not going to allow them to make prudential judgments on whether a potentially um, an offensive event where hate speech will happen or so on will be allowed to happen as a matter of default. We're going to basically use the approach that you said, unless you can produce evidence of a planned incitement to imminent unlawful violence or an unlawful, you know, uh, or a planned unlawful act, in general, free speech events have to be allowed to occur, maybe with, with time, place, manner restrictions. And it was, I, I don't want to go on too long in my question, but Ian, one of the most interesting things in your book was forcing us to think about the difference between an abstract idea so like the marketplace of, of ideas theory, which comes from John Stuart Mill and it goes through Oliver Wendell Holmes. I mean, and it, it is the theory of our constitution. You say at the very beginning, but the fact that our, our politics doesn't operate like an abstract, perfect marketplace of ideas where there's a few people with stalls and they're regulated by whoever's running the farmer's market. And everybody has the right to sell their goods. The marketplace of ideas is not fair to many people. Uh, to, and and it, it's they don't have an e an even opportunity to compete. And I found the same thing in Charlottesville is that that credible threat standard, the the standard that you have to produce evidence that you know that a, of, an, of a planned imminent unlawful act, it was too too restrictive. Was always my opinion because it it kind of tied the city's hands, and it was almost impossible to come up with that kind of evidence because these neo-Nazi plotters were clever enough to frame everything they said defensively. So they would say, if some Antifa member comes and wail, you know, and, and attacks me, then I'm gonna bash their skull in. They wouldn't say I'm gonna bash their skull in on Tuesday at, at 11 o'clock. They would frame what they were saying creatively and they, they were smart enough to, know, to do that. So I wanted to tee up that, that tricky problem and application uh, in light of this fascinating discussion in light of the Westboro Ch Baptist Church decision, which was the where the Supreme Court upheld the right of, of um, the Westboro Baptist Church to come and hold up God hates bags signs and military funerals. And it was this appalling decision that Congress lambasted and tried to, to change. And you really plunge right into the heart of the difference of, the, of these bright line rules and the difficulty in application. And I guess I just wanna ask you about what you thought when you saw Charlottesville, when you were watching it, how you think about things now because I, I I see the benefits of the cases, but I also see how difficult it is at the local level to apply them. Well, uh, yes. I mean, so, so much to talk about there in, in terms of hate speech. I know, I'm and, sorry. That was too, a multi-part question. Let's take a step. Um, no, but, it, but all things that I'm, I'm fascinated by. And um, uh, so I begin uh, the chapter on hate speech with, um, you know, uh, talking about the Tiki Torch uh, March the, the night before the United uh, Right rally um, with um, people chanting, you know, Jews will not replace us. Um, I'm Jewish. Um, and obviously, as a stalwart, um, somebody who sees himself as a stalwart defender of the First Amendment um, and free speech rights, this is you know, still deeply troubling and the most difficult um, sort of theoretical principle, as you say, to, to wrap around um, one's head around and, and to put it into practice. Um, ultimately, um, I, I'm a little bit more 
uh, comfortable and a little bit more supportive, I think, of the Supreme Court's um, current stance on hate speech than I believe you are. Um, let's get to that in a minute. Let, let's just also talk about what that stance is, because so I begin with Charlottesville um, and, and talking about Mike's reaction to um, uh, as mayor to um, you know Trump saying there are good people on both sides um, and um, you know Mike very strongly sort of laid uh, the blame um, for much of this in more elegant language. I actually have it right here. Um, Mike said, um, "I'm not going to make any bones about it. I place the blame for a lot of what you're seeing in America today right at the doorstep of the White House and the people on the president uh, around the president." So. Um, you know, we have this resurface or this resurgence of hate. Um, and people often will say, well, there's free speech, but that doesn't protect hate speech. Um, and that is not legally correct. Um, so then I, I do talk about the Supreme Court's treatment of hate speech with the, their most recent and significant uh, discussion of it, um, the Westboro Baptist Church case, which as you say, is this hateful, mostly a family, not even a, a real full church, but mostly this one family, the Phelps family, um, that says hateful things about gay people and um, other horrendous things like God loves dead soldiers. And they put up these signs at military funerals. Um, and one funeral in particular had done this at hundreds of funerals, but at one funeral in particular um, for Albert Snyder's um, son um, uh, who had been killed um, in Iraq, um, he, the Westboro Church came and put up these signs again, um, and he didn't see them at first because um, his limo driver um, sort of took them into a back um, entrance uh, of the church, but he later saw them on, on TV that night. Um, and it turns out um, that the father was gay out to his family and friends, but not um, in public. Um, his son was not, but it was all the more painful for him that they were saying these hateful um, things about gay people in part because of their warped notion that death, military deaths were God's punishment for America's, um, you know, in their view, uh, unnecessary tolerance of gay rights. So um, the father sues um, the Westboro ch uh, Church for basically um, an intentional infliction of emotional distress. Uh, he wins a multi-million dollar judgment. Um, it goes up to the Supreme Court and, and Chief Justice Roberts, um, who views himself as the most stalwart defender of, of the First Amendment on the, of the court. I don't know if I agree with it, uh, him that he's as strong as he thinks he is, but th it's interesting to show that free speech is not um, is one of the few things on the Supreme Court that doesn't uh, break down under traditional liberal or conservative lines or Democratic appointees versus Republican appointees. Right. So Chief Justice Roberts says that if the First Amendment means anything, uh, and it's important to point out that the protests um, were not directly interfering with the funeral, um, didn't touch any of, of the funeral goers, were on public land, um, and were kept back by police barricades where they stayed. But what Chief Justice Roberts and those were hugely important facts yes. was that they were not engaged simultaneously, and that's a distinguishing factor with a lot of what happened in Charlottesville was they were careful to behave lawfully while they were saying these horrifically toxic. There, there was no fact within their behavior that could implicate them in unlawful activity. That's right, and that and that's a significant difference, and we can talk about that in comparison to Charlottesville. But um, just to finish that, that um, so uh, Chief Justice Roberts says that if uh, our First Amendment means anything, if our free speech rights mean anything, it's that we can't restrict um, speakers because we hate their message. Um, and, and, you know, there is a right of freedom for the thought we hate, which dates back to an earlier Supreme Court decision. And, and I think it's important that we think about the, the we hate because, um, you know, one of the reasons um, that hate speech is, is so difficult is because, um, you know, we can all agree that Nazi speech is bad. That's just a, an objective uh, thing. Um, and yet, um, even that speech that we all can agree we hate um, is protected by the court. Um, and um, it's protected um, when people say horrific things about funerals, uh, at funerals, and it's protected when Nazis say it. So, um, so the theory is quite clear that hate speech is permitted um, and that um, even um, sort of the most incendiary language that stops short of uh, advocating directly for violence um, is protected. 
so then we get into the, the much more difficult um, real world experience uh, of Charlottesville. Um, and, um, you know, I would argue that this was that, that the uh, that the violence and the tragic death of Heather Heyer that happened um, in um, Charlottesville um, was the result of bad policing and, and mistakes in policing um, and crowd control rather than a failure of First Amendment values. Because even though, I mean, it's interesting, of course, in your opinion, and I, I believe you disagree with that somewhat, but, um, but even though um, uh, I have no desire um, to protect the rights of Nazi speech, um, I, I do believe ultimately um, that we need to protect all speakers because otherwise, who decides? Um, and under the Trump uh, regime, um, would liberals have wanted Trump to decide um, who would be able to uh, speak and not speak? Um, and perhaps conservatives uh, feel that way today about Biden. So um, that's a sort of whirlwind tour uh, of hate speech issues in theory, and it is much more difficult than practice. Well, I guess what I would, what I would, I just want to respond a little bit because it's a little bit of dialogue. But then we've got a couple other topics to to get to. But what I what I would say, you know, and I wrote this piece in the Wall Street Journal about this, where um, are arguing that the 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 spree, the the interpretation of the First Amendment some of what you talk about has become too dogmatic. And it's interesting because I think the takeaway from that, like if I had um, time and focus to write a law review article arguing for a balancing test for the sort of evidence that could be introduced to kind of get you through past the gating, almost of a motion for summary judgment where you're just out of court if you don't have clear evidence of what meets the court standard of a credible threat. Um, as in trying to cancel an event or stop an event or relocate it. It's because we lost in court, as you tell the story, we lost in court, in federal court, the night before the rally. We had just tried to relocate it, but because there wasn't, none of these right-wing violent militias who had come had said, we are planning at this moment, I'm breaking this law, even though they did that and they planned, they actually did make statements like that behind a password protected um, chat room on a gaming site called Discord. Which so that, that was the one FBI of the I had knowledge of, which was not ultimately shared with. Um, well, they it time. was it was actually hacked later on. There was a memo that the FBI wrote that didn't make its way through to the cities. There were all these, you know, intergovernmental failures that happened, as you as you rightly point out, on the policing. But I think that there ought to be a way to weigh for experts to talk about likelihood of intentional basically um, inciting intentional mayhem in, in, in places that are, too, that are too close and it's too expensive to handle them. And, it's, and, and we saw that that same year that, and that's where the, in, the pra in practice, we saw it in Portland and Berkeley, we saw, we saw it in the Capitol actually just now, where what's the, what, what's, how can policing actually in practice handle intentional mayhem and, incitement that gallops once uh, once the once the fuse is next to the spark uh, and and that's that that's the fact question and it seems to me that that there ought to be a way for government to talk to the courts about that through through some fine-grained balancing test well see i'm going to push back um and and say that i think that the problem with balancing tests that, um is that um the balance is always almost going to um the, the pressure of a balance is almost almost always going to weigh down more heavily on um, the majority of you um, is going to have mm -hmm. more authority and more persuasive value um, than dissenters. Um, and um, and I, I'm really concerned about that. And when we talk mm -hmm. about when I talk about the, the Colin Kaepernick case and, and the right to take a knee, um, and uh, I, I compare that to Jehovah's Witnesses who during World War II refused to pledge allegiance to the flag, you know, Justice Frankfurter um, basically wanted to say, we have to have a balance between liberty um, and unity. Uh, and in his case, he pushes down um, the judgment in favor of unity. Um, and Justice Jackson says, no, if we if it's a balancing test, we are always going to end up, um, you know, punishing minority speech. Mm. Um, and so I, I am concerned um, about um, adding in too much of a fact 
specific balancing into the general protections we have for even the most hateful people to speak um, because of my concern that it would uh, end up leading to sort of authoritarian um, control by individual communities. Um, again, to me, the, the fix is less on changing the test and more on um, more accurate policing um, and, and police in, uh, or, or more efficient and, and productive policing and, and police involvement. Um, so, you know, I, I, yeah. I talked about incitement in the first chapter of my book. That's a whole nother thing we can talk about. Um, in oh, it's such a good, it's but, such a rich um, discussion. And that's, I hope another, will, that's another issue. We may have time to get into this into the after hour discussion. If, if I mean, there'll yeah. be a lot of open discussion, but if folks want to yeah. join. And I, I just would say that as a, as an applied instance of what you said at the one year anniversary of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, where the city and the state had a chance, and there was a new governor in place and a new, a new city manager, all kinds of different stuff, to apply the lessons and do what you said, it cost over a million dollars. They, they put a stadium plan where they had concrete Jersey barriers around the entire perimeter of the downtown. That was the only thing in this kind of warren of little streets and alleys which made the event so dangerous in the first place because that's where this Robert E. Lee statue was. It was just very dangerous. You couldn't design a plan to keep, to have fixed points of exit and entry and separation with groups easily. So what it costs to do that and what it, what, it, what it required from a local government was extraordinary. It was extraordinary. There was, there was a Jersey barrier um, perimeter around the entire downtown mall of the city and it was a million dollar plan. And so that it, it, Fred Schauer wrote an interesting article, a former Harvard Law professor at UVA saying, courts are gonna start to consider those details as they weigh, which is what you're saying they should, it's a fascinating debate. And, I, and, and the book gets into it beautifully. Thank um, you. Okay. Yeah, and we can do more back and forth yes. about it. Um, uh, as we will for, for long, okay. Let's get to another um, part of the book. We've got about 12 more minutes left in our discussion. Okay, chapter 10, you talk about online speech again, fascinating revelatory case which i had not heard of about whether you could ban child predators from using twitter or or, or people who are you know in, in, i mean what 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 right does the state have over even the most marginal already kind of befouled people to access private social media companies accounts or, or, or websites or, or platforms. And you get deep into this and, it, and it, it, it surfaces all kinds of very profound bright line rules that we have as we think about free speech in the country. So speak about that a little bit. Yeah, so you know, obviously the future of, of free speech is online, um, but the court has been very late um, in addressing this. Um, so I begin my last chapter of the book um, with Sasha Baron Cohen actually um, giving a, a speech, uh, the, the comedian and um, Borat performer, um, uh, giving a speech, a uh, very serious speech to the Anti-Defamation League uh, a few years ago, talking about um, criticizing um, Facebook in particular, but the entire Silicon Six, the leaders of social media uh, platforms, as he calls them, um, for not doing enough um, to curtail um, hate online. Um, and in Sasha Baron Cohen's case, in particular, uh, uh, Holocaust denial um, and, and uh, other anti-Semitic um, posts. Um, so I'd say, what are our speech rights online? Um, and then we go to this case. So the, the Supreme Court's only significant discussion of this case from a very recent uh, of this issue is from a very recent case, um, 2017. This case called Packingham, as you say, a North Carolina law. Um, prevented uh, convicted sex offenders from having any access to social media whatsoever. Um, not just to engage with minors, but any whatsoever. Um, and, and the case goes up um, to the Supreme Court um, and uh, Justice Kennedy in one of his most, um, uh, one of his final uh, opinions um, on the, the bench um, and one of his last speech opinions, um, you know, he talks about how Social media today is so fundamental to who we are as a society that it's like sort of the a proverbial town crier on steroids, or it's the public park um, in uh, the age of uh, a, a demo, uh, an online world. Um, in, the internet becomes your sort of the public park, um, the traditional what's called a public forum, an area where speech is at its most protected. And so, um, 
so what that means then is that if this is so important and so central to our, our free speech rights um, that the government um, cannot um, restrict people's access to social media. And one of the other you know, themes that runs throughout the book is that we have to remember that so much of our, our speech rights are about preventing government interference with speech. Uh, and many of the problems uh, of social media don't involve government interference. So we have this clear rule that um, the court is not going to allow uh, governments um, to have sort of blanket restrictions of people's access uh, to free speech. But what does that mean for the more uh, complicated and, and contemporary issues of, you know, can Twitter um, ban the former President Trump when he was president from um, their platform? Can other platforms label um, their content as uh, people's content as misleading or other things? Can they take political ads from one side or, or the others? Uh, you know, in general, the, Sup the Supreme Court is not clear about this, um, but since they are all private company actions, all of these social media companies are private companies, um, I am confident that the, uh, the current court uh, for the, the long future um, is going to um, be consistently opposed um, to interfering with private companies um, in their interaction with our social media speech. So I don't think that's where the conversation should end. I think there are lots of problems on social media and there are lots of ways we can make change. I just don't think that the court is gonna recognize the first amendment as the tool to make that change. Okay, um, we have, so let's, I, I wanna um, wrap up on a big theme here. Um, your, there was, we had one questioner, James, I'm, I'm probably gonna mispronounce his name, Saranteus from Chicago who asked, uh, sent in a question, can fake news, conspiracy theorists, white supremacy speech be reg regulated or outlawed while preserving first amendment protections? And I wanted to go back, you, you, you talk in the very beginning about Oliver Wendell Holmes, the very famous um, uh, justice who wrote, but not Supreme Court, well, he, was he on the Supreme Court? He, justice Holmes? Yes, he was, yeah, of course, yeah. yes. Um, Sorry, I thought I was thinking of Learned in Hand, the guy who never made it on the board, never board, wrote all the stuff that people write. So Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote The Common Law and he wrote a famous opinion in Abrams saying the ultimate uh, good desires are better reached by free trade and ideas saying that at any rate is the theory of our own, of our constitution. But then you point out that the marketplace idea is problematic because it doesn't talk about lots of people who don't have access to the, to the free market. And I wanted to ask you about conspiracy theories and misinformation and propaganda and the way in which they have intermeshed with our social media platforms today in ways that it seems to me in practice warp or corrupt any idea that there's a free market of ideas out there. And, and that is the facts. And the question is, how are the courts going to deal? Right now, the private companies on their own have had to, in a very herky-jerky way, first of all, have a very libertarian posture. And I, I know this because I've worked with some of them on extremism-related work. Some of them have said, we're just going to try to mimic the First Amendment law that the courts have applied, even though we're a private company. And they say, we're not picking winners or losers. We're going to set uh, you know, basically try to have a marketplace. That's what YouTube did for a long time and Twitter. Then when it became clear that that's not exactly what they're doing because they pick winners or losers all the time. That's why we don't see um, porn in our inboxes because there are algorithms that filter it out. So the, the companies that design the emails that we get or how we get emails, they are picking and they have algorithms in place. So YouTube would, had algorithms in place to incentivize people. There's a great podcast right now, Rabbit Hole, that talks about how it's designed to kind of push and pull people toward the most inflammatory, often false conduct. So you're in this real Alice in Wonderland land where there's not any abstract you know, level playing field. And the question is how should courts deal with that, especially when you have propaganda and lies like QAnon and anti-vaxxer stuff? And do you just say, well, we'll let the market work it out. We'll let people, smart people and journalists weigh and, and pick, you know, upvote or downvote bad contact versus good time. And then we'll, we'll be keeping with, we'll be good with homes or should there be 
is there a is there a different way of of handling those questions? So um, you I know, wanted to end with an easy one. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's very easy. I'll, I'll just whip it off <laughs> in, a, in a minute. Um, so ultimately, um, I, I do even with all the problems of the marketplace um, uh, of ideas theory. You know, who has access to the market? You know, black people didn't, women didn't for so long. Um, you know, poor people today have less access to the market. There, are, these are significant problems with the idea. However, the less um, referred to part of what Justice Holmes goes on to say in that discussion is that he says it is an experiment as is all, you know, as is all life is an experiment. Um, uh -huh. and, and the experimental, because I think what's important about that is that the experimental nature of the marketplace of ideas concept, and more importantly, our sort of full uh, range of free speech protections is not that we will always get to the right answer. Just like in a scientific experiment, you don't always get the results you want. Um, the vaccine doesn't always work out. Uh, the test does not always confirm your theory. Um, but I think that it is still the best process for funneling uh, our societal discussion rather than the best compared to the alternatives. Um, and you know, at the beginning of, of my book, I use a quote from one of the cases that we didn't get to um, called Cohen versus California about a yep. man who wore a, a jacket that said F the draft into a courtroom during the Vietnam War. Um, and in that case, um, one of the great lines is that the court says one man's vulgarity is another man's lyric. Um, and, and that goes on to not be just about, about cursing about you know, who is to judge is always in sort of the real question of, yes, we can all agree on this call about what is right about vaccines and what is right about QAnon and what is right about some things. Um, but that doesn't mean that our society is going to agree on them and, and maybe they shouldn't. So in, in that um, case, uh, Justice Harlan says, the constitutional right of free expression is powerful medicine in a society as diverse and populous as ours. It is designed and intended to remove governmental restraints from the arena of public discussion, putting the decision as to what views shall be voiced largely into the hands of each of us. And I, I do believe that I would rather have the decision about what to hear and what to counter um, in our hands uh, rather than in government hands. And, and as far as I can see, um, if we are trying to police bad speech, the only choice is to um, put it in the hands uh, of, of government. And I believe that is both unconstitutional um, and also a societally bad idea. Well, I, I want, we, we're just about ready to get to questions. I think that one of the, you know, I think you've heard, I hope folks have heard some of the debates here and I have a point of view and you do, and you even see these points of views clash in the court and they've led to some of the decisions and that's what dissents are about. And um, I think that one of the most, one of the most valuable parts of this book is that you have managed to recognize and appreciate and explain the nuances and the debates while having a point of view, which came through very clearly in this, in this talk. And, and that, I think that's a really significant, um, a, a significant add to, to the literature. So it's good to have a point of view, I think, especially right now, it's good to have clarity. And, and one thing even, I, you know, I, I am striving for clarity. I, I'm striving to say, this is what the law is, but again, um, you know, smart people disagree. Um, and, and what I think is uh, particularly on issues like hate speech and, and, and uh, issues um, about how we have a, a truer, you know, sort of um, discussion in the, the online marketplace. Um, but what I would say is I want, um, or sort of, and I am glad about that disagreement. The, the purpose of my book, yeah. as you say, is to sort of streamline what the law is today so that people can then use that to advocate for whatever position they want. You know, it, you don't have to agree with the marketplace. No one has to agree with the marketplace of ideas theory, but you can't engage into a really thoughtful discussion about free speech in our country without knowing about it. So I hope this book gives people the roadmap they need to explore free speech and advocate for change where they see best. I was wondering if it wouldn't be too much before Lonnie hops on for you to do just a tiny bit of a reading, the last paragraph. It wouldn't take more than 30 seconds, probably, because it is the call to action that you're talking about. Uh, oh, the, the last paragraph of the Yeah, expert. and page 199, yeah. OK. Uh, just so it's so. So, so most so of the book, as the I say, um, is a descriptive rather than um, 
um, prescriptive, but in the last paragraph of, of the afterward, I sort of give my thoughts. Um, and I say, having read this book, you can make a difference in shaping public opinion on free speech. You have the knowledge to speak freely with confidence. But even more importantly, you also have the power to engage in debate about legislation and policies that curtail speech or champion it. Although ultimately the Supreme Court will be the final word in determining First Amendment law, the process of getting review by the highest court is long and unlikely. Meanwhile, speech happens on the ground every day at schools, community boards, houses of worship, city council meetings, and these local places are where an informed citizenry can have the greatest impact. Promoting and protecting free speech is not out of reach. It is an everyday grassroots activity because the fight for free speech continues on. And now, hopefully, you can be a part of it, too. Well said. Thank well you. Said. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, for a really engaging, stimulating, lively conversation. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm sure those watching uh, walked away with some great stuff. So we've been putting links in chat to some of these cases. When we send out the video in a couple days, we'll include the links that we put in here to the different court cases. Um, I want to remind folks that we're starting in after hours. We're going to give both uh, Michael and Ian a five-minute break in between this one and the after hours Zoom. Uh, so get a copy of the book from the bookstall. The link is in chat. Come join us. You can be on screen and cameras are on. You can ask your own questions of these two great men. Um, so let's turn uh, to a couple questions. And Mike and I will fight even more than um, this polite discussion. So <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be more exciting. Uh, uh, fight in in quotation marks. Yes. Um, okay, so I want to get to one right here, kind of a practical question from Faye, and let me move this over here so I don't have just my profile the whole time. Uh, so Faye asks, how many cases, uh, Ian, did you have to sort through to narrow it down to the 10 examples you selected, and how did you do that? Uh, well, you know, uh, that's a, a, a really uh, fun question. Um, you know, I, I wanted to sort of have the book um, work two ways. One, um, you can read a chapter you're interested in student speech. You can just read this chapter on student speech. Um, you want to just read about social media, you can flip to that. But I also hoped it sort of worked like a record album that this sort of over all you got the themes that, um, and the, the sort of you see um, the contemporary issues um, uh, don't follow any set pattern, but each case, each chapter um, focuses on a case in chronological order. So we start in 1919. Um, with the introduction of the marketplace of ideas, um, and then we end um, with social media um, in 2017. So I, I was looking for sort of chronological sweep. Um, I was looking for, um, you know, issues that are really um, relevant to all of us today, not only journalists, um, not only advocates, but everyday citizens. Um, and I would say I left like, you know, three fun ones out that I would have otherwise loved to have cover. Uh, I didn't get to flag burning. Um, uh, I, I didn't get to a great case called Whitney where Justice Brandeis says that the solution to bad speech is more speech. Um, and, uh, and I didn't get to get Master Pete's uh, cake shop, uh, the, the gay um, uh, wedding cake case. Uh, which is the intersection of speech and religion. Um, so two First Amendment uh, values competing. But I, I think this book um, gives you the sort of overview and sweep um, that you need. And, um, and those fun extra cases um, are all referenced in the end notes. So, uh, and, ju and just to clarify, it's not a gay wedding cake, but I know what you meant. <laughs> Sorry, a wedding cake for, uh, a, a, wedding cake for yes. a gay- uh, uh, I, understand. I understood yeah. what you meant. I was sort of making a joke. Yeah, um, no, it's important actually for the case, yes. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. Uh, I want to, John Grand, um, well, actually I want to first go, John Grand has made a couple great points in the q and I want to first, because uh, I think this is a quick answer. Uh, Amy asked, or she commented, but I think it's sort of a question, which is, I wonder when talking about kids and free speech, students and free speech in schools, uh, she says, I wonder how those free speech rights apply to teachers. So employees of the school district as opposed to the students. Do you have a quick thought on that? Uh, yeah, the, the quick answer is they also apply um, to teachers. In fact, I, I often um, excise that from the full quote, but, um, but Justice Fortas said in the Tinker decision that teachers and administrators and students don't give up their First Amendment rights as they pass through the uh, schoolhouse gates. 
That uh, school has gates. Um, that's the answer in Tinker. However, another sort of sub theme of the book is that private employers um, generally have the right to restrict the speech of their employees. So, um, so teachers are, you know, public school teachers are, are public employees. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, but in general, employers get to really control their employees' speech. So, um, so teachers are a complicated uh, sort of subcategory there. Okay, and then John Grand, who I adore, he works at the bookstall. Uh, very, very smart man. He's saying uh, his, one point he makes today, Congressman Jim Jordan today claimed that the measures required to stop the pandemic had deprived Americans of their freedoms, including their freedom of speech. That seems fatuous, but freedoms can be suspended in certain situations. With Congressman's argument that our freedom of speech has been taken away, what is he talking about? Well, uh, I can't really answer what he's talking about because I think it's ludicrous. But um, uh, in terms of you know uh, the representative, uh, but um, but um, I, I do think what's important about hopefully. Um, and helpful for this book is that people will cry sort of free speech violation all the time. Um, and I say sort of Americans are sort of crying out about, you know, both conservatives and liberals are sort of crying out about um, what they say to be free speech violations. And so what I hope this book does is not only explain what our First Amendment rights are, but what our free speech rights are not, um, or, or at least where the First Amendment isn't at play. Um, so, you know, freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach, um, to steal another great phrase from Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, uh, it, you know, just because somebody might not have um, the platform to sort of spout anti-vax nation nonsense doesn't mean that there is a free speech violation going on. So that, I'm guessing what he's getting at, what Jordan is, is getting at there. So um, just because, um, you don't get your, um, oh, uh, the senator, who Josh Hawley, um, who said that his free speech rights were being violated because after he was supportive of the insurrectionists, um, Simon & Schuster um, you know, ended their book deal with him. Um, right. Again, no one has a right to have their book published by Simon & Schuster. My book isn't published by Simon & Schuster. Um, and, and I don't have a free speech violation there. Um, and, and, uh, Justice, and Hawley was a clerk to uh, uh, Justice Roberts, so Chief Justice Roberts, so he absolutely knows that um, there is no First Amendment violation there because again, there is no government interference in the speech. Perfect. X and look at that, 8 p.m. So I want to thank you two very nice gentlemen for coming for such a great, enriching uh, conversation. We're really, really grateful. 